Welcome to The Stream, I'm Ahmed Chabuddin. Protests are intensifying in Peru, and the president is under pressure to resign amid widespread anger over the killing of dozens of people protesting the removal of her predecessor. As Dina Boluarte rejects calls to step down, the crisis is highlighting Peru's entrenched social and economic inequalities. Today, we look at the divide and ask how it can be bridged. Joining us for today's conversation, Al Jazeera correspondent Mariana Sanchez joins us from Lima. Renzo Aroni, a historian and anthropologist focusing on Peru and the wider Latin American region, joins us from New York. And also in New York, Eduardo Gonzalez Cueva, a human rights consultant and sociologist. Welcome, everybody. Of course, you can join the conversation as well. Send us your comments and questions for our panel, and we'll put it straight to them. Uh, Mariana, I want to ask you uh, with the latest. I mean, you know, we've looked at this story now for a few weeks as it's developed, um, looking back to December when things sort of were all sparked off. I mean, what really triggered this in your mind? What's important to know? Well, I think this, uh, this, tri this was triggered by uh, the um, uh, ousting of President, uh, former President Pedro Castillo, who was going to be impeached that day. Uh, but who uh, decided to uh, uh, perpetrate a coup d'etat against his own government uh, by um, ordering the army to take uh, the army and the police to take over uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, the control of the streets and also the judiciary, especially the arrest of the um, prosecutor who was investigating him for, uh, on corruption allegations of corruption. Mm -hmm. um, but I think down, deep down, it ha what happened is that uh, when he was elected mm -hmm. in July, uh, sorry, in April of the year before, 80%, I would say, of people in the south of the country voted for him. And he had promised a lot of things uh, during this time. He promised... Um, after he came to office and invited mayors and prefects to the presidential palace, offered them irrigation projects, agrarian reform, mm -hmm. reform of the constitution, and so on. And so they went back to their communities with all these promises after Castillo was the president. So I think that what happened is that once Castillo left the presidency, people saw all these promises fading away and they decided they did not want to give up to them. Mm -hmm. So many people have been talk talking to, not only in the protests here in Lima, but in the highlands of the country where a lot of people live in very poor conditions, is that they say, well, it's not really about Castillo anymore. It's about the promises he mm -hmm. made to us. And since we voted for him, we want those promises and, delivered. And, Mar and that's why they are yeah. and that's why they're protesting. And, and Mariana, as you said that sentence, I mean, both of our other guests nodded. And I want to come to you, Renzo. I mean, it, it seems like people feel betrayed, not necessarily by him, but by the system. They feel underrepresented or not represented at all. What can you share with us from sort of the rural, southern, indigenous perspective, the people who have been the most marginalized for decades now, what, is, what do they want? What's their demand? Yeah, thank you for the questions. Uh, yes, as Mariana says about this uh, very critical moment after uh, Castillo was ousted in December uh, 2022, uh, so her vice president, Lina Boluarte, became the country's first female president but she betrayed uh, the Castillo supporters aligned with the right-wing Congress and the military. And protests evidently emerged in the southern Peruvian Andes, the region that massively voted for Castillo uh, during the 2021 elections. And what seems at the beginning of the protests are demonstrations for defending Castillo and his release from prison turned into a broader political platform that Castillo promised, including a you know, social uh, structural transformation of the country, for, especially for those people who historically were marginalized, uh, uh, indigenous, rural, uh, poor uh, people from uh, the Andes, 
on the Amazon, uh, marginalized popular sectors in urban centers, who are hungry you know, to see some social change, uh, especially after the pandemic time. Uh, mm -hmm. The pandemic devastated the country. Uh, right. uh, what uh, Renzo, I, I, I forgive me for interjecting, if I may. I mean, I do want to come to you, Eduardo, for your take on what we just heard. Maybe if you could contextualize this for us. But before I do, Mariana, we have a video report that you filed for us here at Al Jazeera that I want to share with our audience, just to give us a, a sense more about the context, what's going on. Take a listen. Hundreds of police forced their way into Peru's oldest university. Student activists had allowed protesters to stay there for Peruvians who traveled to Lima to protest against President Dina Boluarte. More than 200 people were arrested. But when they were taken to the counter-terrorism police headquarters, the anger only deepened. People are protesting peacefully, but police are pushing everyone back. Apparently, the order is not to allow anyone to protest. Eduardo, as we heard, this is really about inequality. This is about a deepening divide. When you see uh, that report, when you hear, Eduardo, what we heard from Mariana and Renzo, what's missing uh, for our audience to understand? I mean, what is really contributing to this in this moment? Uh, unfortunately, yeah, go ahead. Now I can hear you. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was saying that in Peru, we have gone through very complex transitions before. 20 years ago, the regime of Alberto Fujimori, a conservative dictator, fell, and there was uh, a combination of demonstrations and institutional changes that brought about the end of that particular regime. Now, after Fujimori fell, there were a truth commission, there were accountability processes, reparations for many victims, but I think that transition had an original sin. And the original sin is that it preserved the constitution that was written for Fujimori a few years back mm -hmm. and that it kept the, is the economic model that functioned under Fujimori. So we made a transition that was a political transition. We made promises in terms of human rights, but we did not change the constitution. We did mm. not change mm. the economy of the country. So in a way, what you are seeing in Peru is what you saw in Chile about three years ago. Right with people that are sick and tired of the fact that they uh, obtain what promises to be a democratic uh, model, but they keep the constitution of the dictator. So that is the situation. And right. Just regarding the images that Mariana was presenting yeah. us a minute ago, you cannot imagine how traumatic it is for Peruvians to see a university invaded in this way by the police. Universities, education, are one of the few social mobility avenues in Peru. People who think that they cannot probably in their lifetimes um, obtain economic progress hope that their children will through education, through schools, through universities. Right. And so to see the police uh, coming and destroying the gates of a university, accusing the people in the university of being terrorists, etc., it only, I think, uh, deepens uh, historic trauma. And, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of um, explaining to us what that feels like for the people who are watching this. As this unfolds on television, on TV, uh, internationally, we have a lot of people picking up on some of the sort of issues you talked about. Castillo, Castillo I should say, being only the second president born outside of Lima to be elected since 1956. And I want to talk about those deepening divides. But as the protesters now move closer and closer to Lima, it seems like there's more intensity happening there. I want to share with you what one uh, activist on the ground had to say. They sent us this video. This is Mahandra. Take a listen. The Peruvian government is systematically committing human rights abuses. There are cries that this is no longer a democracy because there is no right to dissent. There is no right to protest against the government. People are being arbitrarily detained simply for being in the general location of a protest, simply for being in their own homes, filming police outside of their homes who are indiscriminately shooting directly at the bodies of protesters who are simply passers-by. People have been tear gassed within their own homes simply for yelling from their windows, stop shooting at them. 
Eduardo, when you hear uh, the way she frames it, I mean, we've seen the images. We know security forces are shooting some protesters in the chest, in the head. And ever since uh, the president called the national state of emergency, it seems like not only have the protests intensified, but so have the, the crackdown, the attempts by the police and the military, if you will, to restore um, you know, security. So what concerns you most, I mean, in terms of where you think this is headed in, in the immediate few weeks? Is there any way that the president can sort of resolve this, uh, being herself you know, from an indigenous community, uh, much like Castillo? One thing that should be completely clear is that under international law, a state of an emergency does not allow a government to kill demonstrators. A state of emergency means that certain guarantees are temporarily suspended, but it doesn't mean that the police can shoot to kill demonstrators and hope to control a demonstration by shooting. In fact, what is happening right now, I pretty much agree with what we heard a minute ago, is, uh, in my opinion, a crime against humanity. Under international criminal law, a crime against humanity is an attack against a civilian population committed in two possible ways. It's either a generalized attack, and we are seeing that, or is a systematic attack. And I think by examining the autopsies and the information that is coming from hospitals, mm -hmm. we can see that the police is shooting at the body. So what is happening right now is, for starters, that the members of this government are invoking international responsibilities here because crimes against humanity are not just the responsibility of the country that commits them, yeah. but are the responsibility of the international community. So where is this going? Well, if the government continues to entrench itself in this way yeah. and avoid any kind of political solution, we are only going to see a worsening of the human sure. rights situation. And Mar Mariana, you wanted to jump I, in. I, wa I wanted to, yes, I wanted to add what Eduardo was saying. The, what the government is saying is that the majority of people in the country do not want to protest, that they want to work, and that the protests, the roadblocks are uh, uh, contributing, contributing to the mm -hmm. misfunction of the government. Uh, the, the books for the children that will begin school in two months will, cannot be taken uh, around the country. Medicines, uh, medical equipment can't be uh, distributed, and that has to be uh, done, and that cannot stop. And mm -hmm. of course, everything is 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 is, is it, it's true, but like Eduardo was saying, that does not uh, give the government a yeah. green light yeah. to uh, to 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 have uh, to, and to allow. The, 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 the security forces for the excessive use of force. My feeling was mm -hmm. a couple of days ago when we were at the anti-terrorist headquarters where all the detainees from the University of San Marcos had been taken is mm -hmm. that it was a small group of activists. They were in a corner and they, they were like, I don't know, 80 meter, meters away from the front door and the police started pushing everyone back into the streets where there was traffic right. just because so the the feeling is they don't want anybody to protest right and that seems to be and that seems to be kind of what is uh causing all the more outrage i want to ask you renzo when you uh you know you when we try to identify the major problems it seems like there are so many different factors right that have been compounded whether it's the drought, whether it's how hard COVID and the pandemic hit the Peruvian people, whether it's the lack of health care or education, or even the fact that now they're not allowing people to protest and, and the state of emergency is taking away their civil rights. What to you is the most dangerous thing that's happening right now, the thing that is angering the, the majority of the people? I think it is because this abandonment today, the indigenous peoples from like uh, Andes, like Quechua, Aymara people, who are now not only struggling for their rights, for basic necessities, but also for the right to be recognized as a political actors, that they have an agency, uh, the political rights, you know, to uh, construct and, and be part of this state and its nation's building. And so they become pretty much like a grassroots leader organized from the base that want to be here uh, from Peru's centralized uh, country based in Lima that uh, 
historically marginalized them. Mm -hmm. So now they have their agency, you know, to come, uh, you know, to the street, to the plaza, the main square, and mobilize even to Lima, uh, where they can, you know, uh, be here. And because it's the way how maybe the government has to take pay attention you know, to their demands. And so that is something that uh, I see more, you know, more strong in this in this massive mobilization. Yeah, and Mar and Mariana, I see that. Yeah. Uh, please, please, before I bef yeah. before I hear from you, I just want to uh, allow our audience to hear from one of those people on the ground. Uh, of that marginalized community. Let's hear it in her words and then we'll come right back to you, Mariana. Take a listen. We feel marginalized, despised, treated like misfits and terrorists. It hurts us to be marginalized and they say that we are different. It's not that, we just want a better life. We are in the streets because the people reject Boluarte. How is it possible that she asks for a dialogue while killing more than 50 compatriots? That is why the people will never stop fighting until she resigns. Mariana, a lot of the allegations of a you know, kind of corrupt political class, of not being represented, but also hearing their grievances there outlined, what, what was it that you wanted to add? Yeah, yeah, I think I wanted to add, uh, I, I think the fact that things are spiraling in the, in the country uh, is the way the police and the army are reacting to the protests. Uh, violence is not well received in the streets. And of course, there are violent mm -hmm. protesters as well. But the violence that the security forces are uh, are showing with, especially with uh, with fire, using firearms, is 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 simply making people react with more violence. And people say to mm. you on the streets, "I don't care if I die. I am going to fight until I die for my so children." And so, and and to uh, and it's, it, allow me one more thing that is Please. very important is that there are no political costs in these 55 deaths already. We have seen two, uh, two new interior ministers, but the defense minister who was, uh, Alberto Tarola, who was the defense minister when the first big uh, number of people killed uh, in Ayacucho happened on one day, 10 people killed by firearms when they were trying to overtake the airport and the army opened fire. He was not he was not sacked. He was awarded after that with the, uh, the position of prime minister. So people see that in the streets and they think that there will be no mm -hmm. justice for the people that have died. And, and, you know, Eduardo was nodding as you were saying that. I mean, so much of this is about a divide, right, between the political, let's say, corrupt ruling class, at least the per perception of the people, and then a, a large swath of the country. And, you know, I want to share with our audience very quickly, if I may, um, there's this uh, tweet that's, that's going around online, a map of the regions in Peru that were hardest hit by severe dr drought late last year, as you can see here in the south. Um, and, and there's a correlation in terms of the road blockades now that are being put in place by the protesters. Now, I can't guarantee that this is, you know, 100% accurate, but it does give the impression that there almost are two Perus. With that in mind, Eduardo, I want to ask you, I mean, this extremely fragile political system that you discussed, and then the reality of the compounding nature of the crises, the fact that there is a crackdown, where will it lead? What is your fear? And, and, and how, should, how should that help us understand this moment and what might happen? Well, the first thing to understand, uh, Ahmed, is that that map that you show uh, shows indeed a correlation between uh, a drought and the protests but it could also show a correlation between the impact of the pandemic and protests. And it will show also the correlation of the enormous indifference of the Lima elites regarding the rest of the country. Mm -hmm. If something happens in those areas, some people in Lima simply don't care. And I think that the current government made the immoral and very cynical calculation that if uh, protesters were killed in those areas, nobody in Lima would care. So what we are seeing now when the protests move to Lima is um, we are going to find out whether people really don't care about the government shooting demonstrators and shooting citizens. So a system that is this broken and a political elite that is this rejected and this delegitimized 
I think I, it's very difficult to imagine that they are going to solve the situation. Yeah. That is why well, the protests right now are not asking Mrs. Boluarte to dialogue or negotiate anything. They're asking her to go. To step down. And of course, she had made that promise, right, that she would eventually not stay uh, forever. So that's another concern. I do want to hear from her directly uh, where she was kind of mocking, if I can say, or making allegations that a lot of the protesters are, are simply being blackmailed. Uh, take a listen. In communities in the high Andean regions, the sisters and brothers who go out to protest are being blackmailed. They are being coerced. They are told, if you don't go to march, we will ask you for a fee. If you don't go to march, we will cut off your water supply. And if you don't go to march, we will burn your house down. So, Mariana, that was on January 17. Um, you know, uh, obviously, uh, there have been claims that, you know, there's just a lot of vandalism equating the protest movement with vandalism. A lot of misinformation as well online, allegations about the ambassador, a former CIA veteran, meeting with, uh, you know, ministers right before everything unfolded. I mean, I'm not trying to peddle conspiracy theories, but when you hear the president saying that, what comes to mind? Is that helping the situation? No, it's not. It's 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 showing a lack of understanding, to to say the least. I want to tell you, I was in a in a, a remote community in the area of Apurimac, which is one of the most one of the poorest regions in in Peru, and high up in the Andes, where there was absolutely no foreigners, no no one who there was no one who did not belong to that community except us. Mm -hmm. And what I could tell, I want to show you, is that everybody has a phone. Everybody has a phone. Even up in the highlands, the people are, are looking at social media before they go and work in the fields. Mm -hmm. They are listening to the news, and it is through the social media and what they are hearing that people are deciding that they have to come to protest, because, to come to Lima or come to the, down to the communities or to the cities, because they feel it's their time to, mm -hmm. uh, to make their voices and, heard. And but it, it, these theories, forgive me, these theories about yeah. Evo Morales, the former president of Bolivia, uh -huh. interfering, I mean, ask the Aymaras in Puno and they would be uh, they wouldn't care. offended. Yeah. They would be offended well, by the well, fact that they're being told that somebody's telling them what to do and how to think. Mariana, you said that the violence uh, is not playing well in the streets in terms of the crackdown, the response by the government. It also doesn't play well in our chat here. We have someone on YouTube, Cleo, saying, I hope the Peruvian government can stop killing people because they are violating the human rights. Peruvian police are not following the usual legal justice protocols. With that in mind, I want to ask you, Renzo, so many uh, calls from the Peruvian people for a new constitution, for a new election, for the president to step down. Uh, almost it feels like uh, to be included in what they feel they've been completely not included. Uh, in your minds, these calls for constitutional change, what do you hope and expect will happen next? For, for, are there chances for a more inclusive Peru? I do. I do think there is more chance to be more inclusive in uh, responding the claim of the vast majority of uh, social sectors. And for decades and centuries, uh, rural, poor, uh, indigenous peasants have been claiming their inclusion into the nation state building by sending commissioners from their isolated communities to Lima. And they search for a good government that can listen to their demands about the oppressions by abusive local authorities, uh, however, most governments, every government either postpone their demands or reply with repression, as we have been seeing uh, right now. And, and one thing that I, I want to add is about this colonial legacy. Very quickly, we're, we're running out of time. Of if you can, yeah, go ahead. And racism. Yeah, and racism are still vivid in Peru today. Uh, this needs to change. And uh, this has been normalized in practice. And of course. You know, and, and, and that's, and that's and why we're having this, this conversation, Ren uh, Renzo. That's why it's an important part of this conversation, one that we're going to continue to follow here. Mariana, Renzo, Eduardo, I want to thank you for being with us. It's all the time we have for today. But you can always find us online at stream.aljazeera.com. Thanks for watching.